Um, the talk is very specific. It is very specific to Unity. So if you are familiar with other game engines or if you're not familiar with Unity, it might be a little hard to handle. Um, you're welcome to stay if you like though. All right. So I think I'll start with the obvious. Memory is very precious and you should not waste it. Uh, sometimes even more precious than CPU can be because CPU problems I feel are easier to detect in some sense. You can, you can see things going wrong on the screen. Memory tends to kind of eat away at the background and slow your game down and cause all kinds of problems. A lot of times debugging memory is harder. You see them, but the cause is not what is actually on screen. It's something else that happened a long time ago, right? And one of the main reasons why memory is so precious these days, I would say is because of Apple. Uh, they don't like to give memory in their devices. They index more on the speed of the memory rather than the amount of memory that they give you. And what we found on production is that around 20% of our users, they have less than 3 GB of RAM on iOS. 20% um, of our iOS users, right, have less than 3 GB of RAM. That's because some of the latest iPhones that are coming out, they have only 4 or 6 GB of RAM. The older ones, like the 7, 8, the 10, they are all 2 to 3 GB devices. iPads are even worse, like you have iPads from 2018, 2019, that's not even that long ago, which are running 3 GB of RAM. Okay, and so if you have a game that takes up around 700 MB, that's kind of our benchmark. Anything above 500, you should start figuring out what's going on. But at 700, it's definitely time to take action because you will start seeing crashes if you have a crash tracker. You'll get low memory warnings and you'll also start seeing a lot of crashes on these lower end devices. The problem with iOS is that the engagement is actually much higher and even your paying users, the proportion of paying users that you have on iOS is definitely higher than what you'll have on Android, especially when you compare low end iOS devices and low end Android devices. So the problem you run into is that these 20% of users who have very less memory and are not able to play your game properly, they are still actually significant contributors to engagement and revenue. And so you can't ignore them, right? And that's the problem. And so that's why memory is precious because of Apple. Um, so now that you know why I am here, uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Avinash. I work at Zynga as a principal engineer. And I've been on Farmville games for as long as I can remember. Um, I've been on Invest in Express games in generally for the last nine years. And the one thing that's common to all of these games that I've worked on, there's Gardens of Time, old hidden object game. Anybody played it? Very, very old. It was on Flash and whatnot. Then I worked on Farmville 1, the original Facebook version. Farmville 2 Country Escape, that was on mobile with Unity. And then now we are working on Farmville 3, the latest version of it. But all of these games have the same problem. We try to pack in as much content as we can. And as we do that, we start reaching those limits, right? And so we need to start looking very closely at what we can do with our memory. Farm games have an additional problem, and that is that everything is always on the screen. So we always need to show where the cows are, where the grass is growing, what kind of crops are, what the crops are doing here and there. Like, all of that bit is on the screen. You should be able to screen, like pan and zoom and move around. So it's not like we can hide stuff and pull them in somewhere and then reload them again. We have to kind of optimize everything that we have in the game, try and keep as much of it as possible in memory without going over that limit. So hopefully in the next half an hour or so, I'll teach you everything that I know about managing memory in Unity. Of course, there's a lot more, but whatever we can cover here, right? Um, so. I'm going to start with how to use the memory profiler and first identify problems before you actually start to attack them. Uh, we'll cover how to optimize our game assets. So just covering the best practices that we follow for some of our Invest and Express games to make sure that like right from the get-go, right? You're not, you're not putting yourself in a situation where your game does well and you don't have enough time to restructure your assets and optimize for memory and it breaks later. So, there are some very easy defaults that you can start with that will really serve you well in the long term. And the third, I'm gonna talk about addressables. It's a very specific topic, but it's a very useful one when it comes to managing memory. Um, addressables allow you to load and unload assets at will. And so you, you can be really specific in how you decide what gets to be in memory. Comes at a lot of cost, and there are a lot of caveats in it, especially in Unity. So if you're familiar with Unity, I hope you'll really take back something of uh, use from this talk. So I'll go ahead. So we'll start with the memory profiler, okay? 
It's not the screenshot on the left. That is the one that you get in Unity. You just go to like window, analyze, memory, whatever, profile, and it shows up this little bar which with some random graphs on it. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't really tell you anything about your game. Do not use it. Okay, the one I'm talking about is this one, which I will describe to you in a little more detail. It's called the memory profiler. It's an experimental package. Unity, according to me, have done like their best job in trying to hide it from developers, but it's very, very useful. And I recommend that anyone who's looking at optimizing your memory, you should definitely take a look at the memory profiler. Uh, so like I said, it's an experimental package. Um, it's very, very good for detailed memory profiling. You can capture memory screenshots, so you can just like pause the game, take a screenshot, and see everything that's there in memory. You can even see specific objects that are there in the Unity heap. So the one thing about the memory profiler is that it's still running in Unity. So you can capture objects that are there in the Unity heap. You will not see objects that are being pulled in through some third-party library that's running like a C++ plugin or something, right? Um, but as far as your game is concerned, as far as the objects, the scenes, the prefabs, all of that is concerned, you should be able to find everything in the memory profiler, and that's really useful. Uh, you can also compare between snapshots, a very neat feature where it shows you like a diff to show between your previous build and the current one, is your optimization actually working or not? So, I'm gonna give you very quick instruction in, uh, in installation instructions and I'm gonna move on, because like I said, they've just done their best to hide this thing. Uh, so if you're using Unity 2020, you need to go to your package manager and select this checkbox that says enable preview packages, and only then will it actually show up in the list, and then you can select it and install it. Um, and after that, you just go to the window and say analyze, and there's a memory profiler option that's there. Uh, if you're on the new Unity 2021 or above, it's even worse. Like they don't even tell you that there are preview packages. You have to click that little plus button somewhere hidden at the top, and you say, okay, what's the name of the package? You have to hunt for it, do some Google, whatever. Com.unity.memoryprofiler. So you type that in, hit enter, and then you go. Um, so then you can start using the profiler, and it looks something like this. Um, I'll just walk you through it really quickly, right? Mm, do's and don'ts. First, how to just kind of use this thing and get started. The control, basic controls are at the top left. It looks exactly like the Unity profiler, standard profiler, and the same rules kind of apply. Uh, there's that little button that says editor, and then one that says capture. That'll change to device once you actually connect a device to it. And all you need to do is just click capture, and it'll capture a memory screenshot for you. Um, but some really important things to keep in mind when you go about using this profiler. The first one is always profile on device, never even try profiling on the editor. Behavior, especially memory, behavior is very different on the editor. It needs to keep a lot more information at hand, right? It has the scene view, it, had all, it has the inspector, it has like a lot of debug tools and gizmos running in the background. So you want to make sure that what you profile is actually what your players are seeing. And specifically, I would actually recommend you to profile on the problematic device. Like if you find there's a specific device that is running out of memory, like an iPhone SE or an iPhone 7, use that device only to try and profile it. Uh, because memory management varies quite a bit across devices and across OS versions as well. Uh, second one, always enable USB debugging. This is standard, I think. You have to do it even for the regular Unity profiler. But just kind of calling it out. Uh, if you're on Android, enable USB debugging. If you're, on iPhone, if you're on iPhone, you have to kind of trust the device or whatever, that little box that comes up. Um, when you give a device build to actually run on the device, make sure you've selected that it's a development build, and there's a little option to say auto-connect profiler. Make sure that is checked as well. Uh, so then once that's running, you just click capture. It takes a memory screenshot. That screenshot, that process of capturing actually puts your device, it's pretty intensive. So it's going to take like 30 seconds to a minute to actually do that on a device. It's pretty fast in the editor, but don't let that fool you. Um, but don't let your device go to sleep. Your snapshot kind of gets ruined if that happens. So make sure you set that lock timer off. Just some of those things that I've written down in my notebook right over the few over the last few years. Um, so now I'll actually tell you a little bit more about the profiler itself and the kind of information that it shows you. Um, as you click capture on the left, you will see these screenshots and the actual memory capture that it does. You can load multiple of them, and you can even there's even an option to compare between two snapshots. And if you click on one of these on the left, um, it shows you this entire block in the center, right? The whole thing. The topmost panel is your basic information. Not very useful if you are looking for a specific problem, but it's just good to kind of see 
how much memory you're using for like audio or on the Unity heap. You'll know whether the problem is on the Unity heap or whether it's in a DLL or a plugin or something, right? Or whether you're pulling in some kind of code that you don't know about. Um, so that's just to give you a basic idea. It's good to like kind of compare between releases and just see quickly if, if you're on the right track or not. Um, the next window is the most fascinating part, which is this tree map that it shows you. It breaks down all of your um, things into, <laughs> should I? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it breaks down all the categories that you have in your memory into different blocks. So you'll have texture, audio, shaders, uh, render textures, all of that showing up. And it shows you how much memory you're actually showing, uh, you're actually using for each one of those segments. And I'll move on to the next one. Can't have a presentation without some technical difficulties. So, um, so this is the most interesting part of it. It's kind of low res, so we'll probably get a better look at it a little later. Uh, but it breaks your it breaks all of your memory components into different parts. Like this is like texture, that's audio. This is you can't read it, but yeah, there's shaders, render textures all of those bits. And this is what is the most useful part. When you're looking for a problem and you don't know where it is, you would open this part of it, zoom into whatever you can. You can click on each one of those boxes and it will actually show you each object in that particular box. Um, so that tells you where the problem is, whether you're over indexing on textures, whether you have too many audio, uncompressed audio clips, all of that stuff. And that's what you use to identify and optimize your code further. Uh, and the last part, this little box at the bottom, it actually lists every single individual Unity object for you. So you can just hit right click, there's a filter option, and you can search by the name of the object if you like, or the type of the object. And you can figure out what you actually have in memory. I find it really useful to verify that when we've added a fix, it's actually working or not. So I look for specific objects that I'm expecting to either be there or not be there, and just confirm that that's the way it works. Like I said, always do this on device, don't do this on editor. It's completely meaningless on the editor. Okay, so now that you know how the profiler works, let's move on to some asset optimization, right? This is the, these are the best practices that we've learned over the years. They're very tiny things, honestly. Very easy to miss, um, but they've helped us a lot to kind of keep down our memory usage and optimize for adding as much content as possible in the game. Um, so I'll start with textures, right? And the most important thing you need to know about textures is this little option called read write enabled. What this does is it stores an extra copy of that texture in memory because Unity thinks that you're gonna use this texture from the code. Now it's disabled by default and normally this should not be a problem, but as you know with like every single project you're like hurrying and trying to check in your prefabs and all of that and somewhere someone checks that checkbox and before you know it people have cloned it and copied it and done all sorts of things and there are like 50,000 textures in your app they all have they all have read write enabled and you're using double the memory that you would actually use so make sure this is disabled right you can even write a script you can write an asset preprocessor script to check this flag and make sure that it's always disabled. There are genuinely times when you need it, by the way. If there are places where you might want to scale something in the code, like a picture, like an image or something, you want to scale it or downsample it, you're actually referencing that texture in the code, then use it. But otherwise, just keep it disabled. Similarly, MIP maps. There's a very common misconception, I think. How many of you know what MIP maps are? Are you all kind of familiar with it? Okay, I'll give you a quick one-liner on it. MIP maps are like thumbnails for images. So it generates smaller and smaller and smaller images. Unity does this internally if you select this box. Now, why does it do it? It's, it's very useful in a case where, let's say, let's say you're on Farmville and there are a bunch of buildings that you want to see. You can zoom the camera in and you can go, you can zoom the camera out and you can zoom the camera back in. In those times, it replaces, when you zoom out, it's going to use the smaller images so there's less detail and when you zoom in, it's going to use the larger images so that you have more texture detail on your assets. Now, that's great for assets where you actually have to move the camera angle and look around, but in most cases, especially UI, right? UI assets tend to be pretty heavy. They print, the textures tend to be pretty detailed, but you're always gonna see them with a fixed camera angle. And in those cases, you don't need MIP maps, just disable them. So again, when Unity starts generating MIP maps, it's going to do like a half and a quarter and a one eighth and so forth. And that roughly comes out to about 2x the memory. So you should be very careful with that. 
Um, the third one, if you're really desperate, you can reduce the max size to make sure that nobody in your art team checks in anything that's greater than, like 2048 is a nice default. I think that's pretty standard across a lot of places, but you can bring that down even further if you're strained for space. So you can make like 1024, even if someone uploads a larger image, during importing, Unity is going to resize that down. And the last one, of course, is compression. Always compress your textures. Uncompressed textures are just crazy large, and you never know how much detail's actually gone into them. Always compress your textures. And um, there are a few options here. I don't want to go into too much detail here, but the, the most common ones are ETC, PVRTC, and ASTC, okay? You'll see many different options um, beyond what they actually do technically, and even I don't know what, what they really do be in, in behind the scenes. The best way is to just switch between some of these, observe the quality, and see whether they fit your app or not. The goal is to minimize the size of the asset, like maximize the compression, without losing quality on your app. So if it looks okay to your art director, then checkbox, move on with that compression ratio. ASTC, please pay special attention to that because it's a newer option. It's only available on GLES 3.0 devices and above. So if you're catering to a slightly higher end device market, uh, you should probably be on ASTC. If you're developing a game right now, you should probably be on ASTC. But if you're on an older game and you need to support legacy devices, like much older devices, especially on Android, then consider going back to ETC and PVRTC. Meshes, I'm not going to say much about them. There's actually not much you can do, to be honest. The biggest advice I can do, I can give you is just sit with your art team and reduce your vertex count. Just sit with them, fight with them as an engineer, just like fight with them and say, I don't want so much detail. Till they are happy with you and they say, okay, fine, you know what? It's fine, I will live with this. You go do your job. That's the best you can do. Um, mesh compression does not work for memory. Uh, it does help to bring down your app size though, but meshes are actually stored uncompressed in memory, so it's not gonna cause any effect. Meshes also have a read-write enabled flag. Okay, it is off by default, but the same thing can happen. People can just randomly enable them and copy meshes and stuff. So just pay attention to that, make sure it's off. It works exactly the same way. The read-write enabled flag is so that you can access the mesh from code and modify it if you want to. And that may be a genuine use case for you, but for most people it isn't. You just want to have a prefab and have it show up on screen. Then you keep that flag disabled. Um, audio is an interesting one because the compression ratios on audio are very high. So what that means is if you're using like a wave file, if someone checks in a wave file, that wave file is gonna be massive. But when you compress it down, it becomes literally nothing, right? Um, it's all about, again, a trade-off between quality and how much you wanna compress and like save on memory. I would recommend that if you have, if you're not focusing on audio, just force all your assets to mono. It's just a checkbox at, the, at Unity. It's really good and it, it's just immediately going to make sure that you have only one channel active and not multiple stereo channels. Um, unless you really want people to, you know, like listen to the audio and carefully, if that's part of your gameplay, then of course, by all means, don't do this. But for most games, force to mono should work. Uh, the load type is interesting. I thought I'll just discuss it once very quickly. Let's say you have like a small sound, like a game sound, an ambient sound, and some background music, right? Game sounds are quick. You need your character to jump and you need that sound to be heard immediately and give that feedback to the user. You want these to be really small and you want to set them to decompressed on load. So what Unity does is it pulls them into memory and keeps them there so that it can quickly reference them and play that file immediately. Uh, ambient sounds, like stuff that's happening in the background, you're fine to just say compressed in memory if they're small. Anything more than 30 seconds, don't do this. Move to the third option, which is the music. Like for music and longer files, just say streaming. Because you don't need them to be played immediately, but, you, but what Unity will do is then stream them directly from disk and not waste any memory storing that file. Um, you can reduce your compression bitrate if you really feel like there's a lot of audio. Normally audio is not the bottleneck in memory. There are textures that are usually much more. Um, as for compression, just stick to Warbase. It's safe, it's default, it's cross-platform, works, uh, works across a lot of devices. I think there are some newer ones available, but honestly, this works without any problems most of the time. Uh, the last thing I'll call out is that there's a mute option on the audio clips and in the audio sources. Try to avoid using that, especially if you're focusing on memory and even CPU. What the mute option does is, it's still, Unity is still calling the update and trying to play that component, the audio source or the audio file. Um, just because you've muted it does not mean that Unity is not doing anything in the background. It's still reading that file and it's still actually moving through the file and processing every frame. 
it's just not playing the sound that's all so if you really if you are really crucial about mem like if you are really critically looking at your memory and you don't want audio to interfere you want to mute it just destroy that component just destroy the deactivate the component or destroy that object and it actually helps you a lot more even in terms of cpu so now we'll come to addressables how much time do we have okay should be okay <laughs> it might be fast um this is going to be a bit detailed but bear with me while i explain the basics so addressables is a system in unity to load and unload assets from memory okay uh, the main reason is it's it provides like a very clean separation between your asset and between the actual file path where that asset is situated so you can actually move assets around restructure your project however you want and it's like a prefab you basically drag it in add it in your component and you can pull it in by reference instead of pull it in, pulling it in by file path like a lot of times people do resources dot load with asset slash texture slash ui slash whatever yeah so you can avoid that and just add a reference there in your component um you can also group these assets together and that's your main tool for actually managing memory um unity will also handle if that there are multiple assets that are dependent on each other like there's a car and you have to pull in the wheels and you have to pull in the hood and all the different parts of the car as individual prefabs it does that for you and as an added benefit they make sure to make sure that asset addressables is also compatible with your cdns and s3 storage for example so it's basically meant to allow developers to serve downloadable content without too much of a hassle so you can create these groups and you can package them as bundles and addressables will take care of uploading it to s3 for you or some kind of cloud provider right and you and then your game can choose to download whenever it needs to um there is a system called asset bundles that are there in unity addressables is just a rehash of asset bundles it's a cleaner ui and a better interface for the same thing but underlying the the underlying system is actually the same so addressables are your main tool for actually going really deep and managing your memory and i'll talk a little bit about some of the problems that can arise when you start using addressables so in concept okay i should probably start by saying addressables itself is a session on its own there's quite a bit to cover and there and there are a lot of use cases here i'm going to focus mainly on the memory aspects of it but for those of you who are unfamiliar i'll try and cover this like really quickly just at a very conceptual level so i have four prefabs okay background image 1 2 3 4 i can rename them i can call them bg1 bg2 bg3 bg4 it's easy for me and i can also move them into these groups and i've just created two groups here one is called group 1 and another one is called group 2 group 1 has only one asset bg1 and group 2 has 2 3 and 4 okay at a very high level that's all that addressables does it's just allowing you to organize your assets in a different way that is not dependent on file structure now i write a script okay and all it does it does two things it does addressables dot instantiate and that pulls your asset into memory and it does unload image um uh, sorry the unload image function is going to say release instance and it's going to say okay i don't need this asset anymore bye okay so what i do is i call the script it has two buttons i wish this were a live demo but i was really not confident pulling this off <laughs> so i i load my image let it come on screen then i destroy the object and i say release okay what do i expect to happen what i expect is this on app launch this is just the default okay there's nothing from my project here this is what unity packs in on its own everything is in kbs there's like literally nothing on the screen here when i hit load image it's going to pull my texture in image 1 and it takes up 11.1 mb and then i destroy this object and i say release it unloads it and we are back to what it was earlier right so this sounds very simple you load something in it's going to pull it into memory till then it's not there and you know for sure that it's not there and then when you say release it's gone so think of a pop up or a window or something before you call it like at the start when you actually want to show it to the user you say load show like a little spinner or whatever till it loads in and then show it to the user after they are done with it you get rid of it and you get back your memory so that's a great way to manage memory right seems to work perfectly obviously it doesn't um so yeah sure what could possibly go wrong <laughs> the most important thing is addressables have the potential to duplicate your assets and the way this works is that is if there is some 
some resource in your project that is actually not part of an addressable bundle and there are other prefabs that are referencing it, like prefab A and B, they're in different groups, but they both reference this particular material. That material is going to come into both groups. It'll, it'll, get part of, it'll be part of group one and part of group two because it's not part of any group, okay? There's a simple fix and that's to just go to Unity. They have this analyze window in addressables. It's quite easy to find. And there's an option there to just check for duplicate bundle dependencies. So you run this and it'll tell you which are the assets that are potentially going to be duplicated. What you do then is you create a new group, create it, just call it something like a dependency group and add your textures there. Add anything that's not in a bundle that goes into like a default group that you've created. So now it loads, it makes sure to load that group in before it actually calls in your other, other prefabs. And that solves this problem of duplication. Still simple, right? Not really because it really doesn't work the way you expect it to. Like one of the biggest drawbacks of the Unity Asset Bundle system is that you can load an asset whenever you want to, granularly, image by image, like pixel by pixel, whatever. You can never unload it. It has to unload the entire bundle all on its own. So the way this works is, imagine now if I had loaded BG2, 3 and 4, the other three images, instead of the first one, okay? Now I unload three and I destroy three and four, and then I call release on them. I'm not going to get back my memory. They're still going to be held in memory. And the reason for that is because BG2 from the same group also has a reference to it, okay? Now this might seem like a drawback, but again, Unity has a way to fix it. And that is that every group that you create has an option called bundle mode. Remember I said addressables are based on Unity's asset bundle system. Every group has a bundle mode called pack together, pack separately or pack together by label. I'll tell you what those are. Pack together is the default, okay? That means everything comes together as one bundle. Pack separately means they get split into different bundles, okay? So then that's great. Like everything is a different bundle. You can unload it whenever you want. Problem solved, right? Still sounds too easy. That's because it is, right? Because the more bundles you have, the more memory Unity itself is going to take to try and track those bundles. So it's like that juggling image in the beginning. The more you kind of toss in there, the more that comes back down at you. Um, finally, what it means is that you need to understand your assets and you need to structure them. And this is like a basic template that I have put together that we use quite often in quite a few of our games. And I'm hoping you all will find it useful. Um, we categorize our assets. There are more categories, but these are the basic ones, right? Um, we categorize them first into base assets. These are, you pack them together and you just load them. You know that there are certain buttons, images, textures that the player will see all over. They're just there, they're part of your UI, they're part of your levels, they're part of the walls, buildings, windows, whatever it is, right? Uh, pack them all together and just load them at the start of the game. Okay, that's exactly like how resources used to work. So just assume it's the same thing. Then you look at your UI elements and you categorize them by theme. Try and identify where they show up, when they show up. Uh, so you might have one part of the level that's all, I don't know, Purple. So you group all your purple assets there, put them in a bundle and pack them together. And now you know that every time the player enters this part of the game, they are going to see this asset. Once they leave that part of the game, that asset gets destroyed and you can get back your memory. Third, these large UI backgrounds that come up. We have a lot of these introduction pop-ups that come up at the start of the game, for example. You're only going to see them once, like a small animation that tells you, oh, welcome to this screen. Or it's like a reward screen or whatever. Um, so like super mega awesome bonus, whatever. All those big screens that kind of take up a lot of attention of the user, group them separately. Just pack them in, pack them together as separate bundles because you know that as soon as they're gone from the screen, you need to be able to unload them. They tend to be very heavy textures and you want the detail on it because that is a really important part of that user experience, like a reward screen or something, right? So make sure to group those separately. Um, finally, things that go in and out of the screen, in our case, it's a lot of these animals and buildings and characters. Um, you can pack them separately so that only if they're placed on the farm, only if they're active in the scene, they're actually loaded into memory, otherwise they're not going to be. And finally, we also do different bundles for our text, audio, and game data. And that is it. Um, if you have any questions, we can go through them. How much time do we have for questions? Five minutes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. 
Hey guys, just one quick announcement. Uh, at around six o'clock, we have award ceremony in the garden. So please be there by then. Hello. Yeah. I have a doubt that uh, if you are uh, working on PC builds, yeah. so can we use memory profiler and how do we use it in that case? Okay, that's a great one. You need to do a build. You can't use the editor. Like the editor has a built-in player, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. So never profile with the editor there. What you do is you give a PC build, launch it as an EXE, okay. and as long as it's a development build, it's got that profiler connection, yeah. Unity will detect it. It will detect it as a new player mm -hmm. uh, through a local port, okay. and you will get your profiling data. So that's the right way to do it. And that the same way for WebGL builds, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. It's the same for WebGL. Okay. Thanks. Though I'm not sure if the browser is going to interfere with your WebGL stuff, you will have to try that out and tell me. <laughs> There's one at the back. So have you tried Unity as library? Sorry, which library? A Unity inside an Android native application. Oh, you need uh, packaging it as a library inside yes. an Android application. Um, not really. I'm asking this because uh, <coughs> the profiler won't work in that use case. The memory profiler. So the memory profiler works by connecting to the player. Yep. And if your app is using a Unity player to display something, it should work, but no. otherwise I'm not very sure. If it because works. we have an use case where we have Unity as a library hmm. and we want to check the uh, memory spikes. So we are unable to utilize the memory profiler. That is one use case. Okay. And the second one is about, <clears throat> I was checking out uh, the image texture resize algorithm, hmm. which you have not mentioned it anywhere. Uh, the bilinear and the uh, the Mitchell, Mitchell algorithm. algorithm. Yeah. So throw some light on that. So how do okay. we utilize that? So I don't know technical details, to be very <coughs> honest with you there. Um, but it's a question of, it's some kind of resizing algorithm, right? You're taking a larger image, you're compressing it, and you're not compressing it, you're downsampling it. But basically, you're reducing data from that image. You're bringing down the size. Now, when that happens, you're bound to lose quality. And it's a question of how much quality you are willing to lose. Okay. So if someone checks in like a really large image and Unity is like, let's say it's like a 25 MB image. Okay. And you specified your max size as like 512, 1024. It's going to come down to like this much. And so at that point, no matter which algorithm you'll, you'll use, you'll see a lot of artifacts there. So for you, I think the best thing to kind of evaluate this, if there is a difference between the algorithms, is to take a sample image, convert it, actually see it on screen on the device that you want to see it and see if the quality is acceptable for you there. Trial and error. Yeah, basically trial and error. Yep. And then figure out which, are, say, which setting you actually need. Yeah, and uh, uh, I was figuring out another use case. You have not mentioned anywhere the usage of pot, uh, power of two. Ah, that's a good one. <laughs> um, okay, so apparently, I've done a bit of reading on this, but apparently the power of two thing is not very important. Okay, wait, wait. I'll start by saying the power of two. Okay, who knows what the power of two rule is? Right. Okay, great. Quite a few. For those who don't, it's just that each side of your image needs to be a power of two. And if it's not a power of two, the graphics card is anyway going to pad it, make it a power of two, and then render it on screen. Okay, and that's the, the reason for that is because it saves you a lot of CPU cycles to do calculations in binary based on power of two. So apparently that's not a thing with new graphics cards anymore. Yeah. So you can, if you're developing an application today, you can choose to ignore that rule. You don't need to have power of two textures. You can have them whatever you want and new graphics cards will handle. So iOS will definitely handle it for you. Same thing, right? The older Android devices, especially those that are running OpenGL ES 2.0, they are going to struggle. And so if you're going to cater to those images, you should keep power of two textures. What I have observed is uh, by having the POTs, uh, we would see lesser uh, build sizes. That is one point. And mm. uh, I was not aware of that. Maybe. Yeah. So POTs Maybe. reduces the APK sizes. And uh, the ASTC format, which we just spoke a few minutes yeah. back, yeah. ASTC also uh, produces a lesser uh, 
APK sizes as well. Yeah, ASTC is definitely, if you can choose to have ASTC in your app, you should definitely have ASTC. It's better compression with less quality, with less uh, loss in quality. Um, and it's going to bring down your bring say, build size as well as help you on memory usage as well. Yeah, one last question. Sure. So <laughs> whenever we generate a build, we will get a uh, build log. Yeah. Where we can see uncompressed size of each and every asset that your project uses. Yeah. So how do we know the actual size of an image that APK holds? Whatever we see in the log is just an uncompressed size. Yeah. But so, we want to know the actual size in the APK. There are two ways. If, if you can directly find the image in the APK package, that's one way. Actually, the more common case is that you put it into like addressables and generate asset bundles. And then you can look at each asset bundle becomes a single file in your APK package. So you can just, like when you have a build, right, you can just unzip that build, open it like a folder, browse through it and search for these asset files. And each of them will have a size listed to them. That's their compressed size. So that's what you'll know is actually contributing to your file size. But we can't rip the images from the build, right? Once no, you we... can't. But you will know... We can only have the split files inside the yes. when you unzip. Yeah. If you're using mm -hmm. asset bundles, you can clearly see the size of each asset bundle. Yeah, so bundle you'll know can. in groups of images, which is why it helps a lot if you categorize similar images together. Then it gives you a very good idea of where the problem lies, whether it's in your base assets or the large UI assets or the audio. You'll see that particular asset bundle has a different size compared to others. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks a lot. Guys, we have some more time if we have any other questions. Uh, so you have mentioned that uh, uh, we can uh, pan the map. Uh, uh, so there will be a lot of assets getting uh, loaded into the memory. So is the addressable best approach to load uh, um, everything like uh, the area of the, let's say we have like specific area where we want to show some asset and then pan into the different area. We release this uh, asset. Is it the good approach or what? Yeah. So the final kind of piece that you always need to keep in mind when you're dealing with memory is garbage collection. Okay. And what happens is it's a byproduct of how the OS is handling that memory. So if you load and unload assets constantly from memory, you're going to accumulate basically gaps in the heap. And then the garbage collector is going to kick in and try and clean that up. Right? You'll see these spikes in Unity. If you open the profiler and see, look for garbage collection. If you're constantly loading and unloading things, it doesn't even need to be addressables. It could be creating objects, like you could just be creating objects randomly or just switching between things really quickly. It's going to happen. And that again is going to impact your CPU performance. It may recover memory for you, but then if your app is going to like hang every 10 seconds because the editor or the game is trying to collect, like, like the garbage collector is running in the background and cleaning up all the memory, that's, that's a bad experience as well, right? So it's clearly a trade-off between how much you can afford to keep in memory, how much you need to optimize and how often you can clean it up as well. I think one of the best things I have learned about garbage collection is that Unity has a gc.run function. And so at a point where you have a break in the game, like, like a UI is just finished or one level is just over, just call GC alloc when there is no, sorry, call GC run when there is no action really happening at that place. So then it gives you that little bit of extra buffer. You can do more with your memory. You can have more things spawning in and out without interrupting the user. Like you will control when the user gets interrupted and that's always better. Uh, shall we use crunch compression? For asset bundles? Uh, no, for general in textures, like for all textures, to reduce uh, sizes. Yeah, it's a slightly different problem. It focuses more on your how much time it takes to load in that texture versus how much time 
uh, it would take to kind of just read it uncompressed from file. If you want your load times to be fast, you should do uncompressed, but then that's horrible for memory, right? So then crunch compression is like a trade-off. Like you can't afford to fully compress it because that load time is very high. Therefore you try crunch compression. It breaks it up into bits and it tries to uncompress it faster and keep it in memory. Uh, it's more for a load time optimization than specifically for memory from what I know. There's one more at the back. My question on the performance side bit, like Unity, why don't make the GPU instancing turn on by default? I have no idea, to be honest. <laughs> I'm guessing it's a pretty expensive operation and you want to use it only, only in particular cases. So honestly, no idea why they make a choice like that. I, like, I'm not a graphics expert, just okay. mostly just been making games and trying to figure things out. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for being with us. All right. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Vinash. Bye.